Thank you for joining us for this uh, roundtable or panel discussion through Chicago Alternative Comics Expo, CAKE in Chicago. Uh, my name is John Mastentono, and I'm an organizer of CAKE since 2017, I think. Um, because of the gap year, because of COVID, CAKE decided to do programming uh, with some of our favorite artists. That would hopefully be something that people would enjoy now and also return to in the future. So we tried to pick kind of general subjects that would be of interest that are maybe not explored in journalism about illustration or comics. And the, the name of this program is Cake Pops. So there are a number in the series. There's one about Quimby's bookstore. There's going to be an interview with Jim Terry who did a beautiful independent comic um, about his experiences and they'll just there'll be a number of others as the summer goes on. But our topic today, what I wanted to talk about is how spiritual practice informs creative work with the two artists that I have with me today. So I have with me the first artist I have with me is Joss Jot Sing Hans and he's an illustrator unendingly inspired by an explosive neon mix of fashion, music, and pop culture. He has a constant regard for things past and a veracity for all that is current. His work chronicles themes of body image, sexuality, and self-love. His clients include The New Yorker, NPR, Google, and Vogue India. That's a really good bio. And he's been to Cake three times and is awesome. And I wanted to talk to him more so I'm excited that we have this opportunity to do that. And the other person joining me is Alyssa Berg. Alyssa was raised in the great Northwest and currently lives in Brooklyn, New York. She writes, paints, and self-publishes small edition books and zines inspired by plants, magic, and heart opening. Most recently, her work has appeared in Ink Brick and Ley Lines. And I was saying before we started, we had a minute to talk, and I was just saying one thing that these two artists have in common is a use of color that is truly visionary, like not as a filler word or as a, not as just talking, but as like channeling to me, as I look at it, like on its own wavelength and in its own path. And, uh, yeah, two of my favorite artists. So I'm excited to talk to you both. And especially about this topic, since, since the pandemic started in America, since, you know, since March, 2020, I've been not making as much art, but much more interested in Theravada Buddhism and meditation and reading about Buddhist topics and going to meditation Zooms and, you know, Reiki workshops and chakras and just things of this nature to try to like make the world around me better and to try to make friends with my own consciousness. And that's been more of my focus. So when we tried it, when Cake started talking about how or what do we want to do, I was like, well, that's my interest. So I wonder if there are artists who would be willing to maybe talk about how they feel about that. Because I, you know, anytime I have to draw, there is some relationship between my spiritual journey and like how I'm approaching a drawing. And I don't understand necessarily how that works, but I'm very curious how it works for other people. Um, that That's kind of my thesis or kind of where I'm coming from. And if it doesn't work, we can say, hey, we tried, but I want you both to feel comfortable to, you know, to explore this topic. And, and, and it seems almost like a taboo subject in the field that we're in because it can be vulnerable to talk about um, things that, that matter so deeply. Um, but also I think it's a, essential and I'm excited to, to talk. I'm excited to hear what you both have to say. So there's a podcast on being that, <laughs> that I like and usually those podcasts begin with the question Joss Jett, I'll ask you first, what was the spiritual background of your childhood? However you would choose um, to define that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the wonderful intros. I feel so important. Um, so I, I think I'll start with my 
religious background because I feel like um, if you're a kid that's born into a religious household, uh, any religion, um, you kind of lack the awareness to like critique it or distance yourself from it. So that's just kind of what you know, what you start with. Uh, so I'm sick. The word sick itself means uh, to learn or to be a student. Uh, Sikhism is a fairly recent religion. It's about 550 some years old. Uh, so a lot more recent than say Christianity or Buddhism. Um, and I grew up in Delhi where I was born into a Sikh household. Um, and Sikhism has three core tenets. Uh, which is meditating on the one entity that we sort of call God. Uh, and in Sikhism, we believe uh, Ik Onkar is how we say it, which means like one God. So it's like whatever power you sort of um, pray to, they're all like one. Uh, and then one's truthful living and then service to humanity, uh, especially to the ones that are less fortunate. And that's something that's really important to uh six and the community in general um so i think a lot of these tenets in my understanding of them just pointed to like general uh creating good karma and to not be a jerk <laughs> uh and to just be like an overall decent person uh and that's kind of what i think my uh understanding of like conduct in terms of oh this is what um connects you to your religion or like something that like centers you um yeah so that's kind of like my beginnings in terms of understanding or unwrap wrapping my head around uh spirituality that's fascinating i've always found you to be a very warm person like just a very welcoming and warm and just radiating kindness. So that's fascinating. That's interesting to hear how you process it. I researched Sikhism, you know, I, when I knew we were going to speak, it was not a subject that I had great familiarity with, except about um, people being racist against anyone who was not white after 9-11. That was kind of the extent of what I knew, <laughs> which was horrible, but now I know more. So thank you, thank you for that. Oh, Al Alyssa, thank you, thank you. Alyssa, can you tell me about the spiritual background of your childhood or? Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. Um, I did not grow up with a formal religious background. Um, both of my parents did, and then kind of moved away from that um, in their own time, but before I was born. So I had grandparents who were, were religious and would occasionally attend church with them, but only on like the big days. So I have like a really strong memory of um, Palm Sunday and like carrying these big palm leaves with all of the other kids and kind of being like, yeah, this is good. You know, this is, it, it was touching more of the mystical parts of religion, I think, when you get in there on the big holidays with the big stories. And then, of course, I didn't have the sort of commitment to a religion as a kid. So I knew a lot of my friends growing up were religious and kind of had issues with going every Sunday or going on Friday evenings or whatever it was. Um, so I kind of got the best of these worlds where I saw this really special ritual and also had space from it. And it made me really question. Um, I went to a day camp, a church camp with a friend. And one of the things you could sign up for was um, learning to speak in tongues. And of course, all of the other kids were like signing up for soccer and like arts and crafts. And I was like, what? Like send me to that speaking in tongues. So I went there and there was one other kid. And I think I was probably like 10 years old. And there were three adults there telling us how, how, like how to speak in tongues and how it might just strike you at any moment. And I was kind of like, wow. 
you know, all of these moments were just sort of radical in this way. And then I also think just growing up in the Pacific Northwest, as I look back, it wasn't like I was a kid thinking these trees are my spiritual experience or, you know, this moss is like God. But when I look back, that, that definitely shaped and informed every part of me. And anytime I go back, I just, I feel that place like in my heart that's so connected. And I got to, you know, I had woods in my backyard and I would just go like run home from school and be like, gonna play in the woods. And then we'd be out in the woods for hours. So that's stuff. And that's still like to this day is like a really important part. Like plants and nature are a really important part of my spiritual experience and practice. And very on brand that you like the palms, like Palm Sunday is like palm fronds, right? If, if my recollection is correct. And that's like kind of the one element of Christianity that has a plant in it. And you're like, oh, that's the one I like. Yeah, I just remember like walking with them in this yeah. group and it being very cool. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's very, I, I don't even remember what the metaphorical significance of it is in the story of the resurrection of uh, Jesus at all. I mean, I, and I was raised Catholic and I, we had to do that every year, but I, I couldn't tell you. So you have these fragments that have informed the rest of your life. That's awesome. That was a very comprehensive answer, both of you, and I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. But no, that's awesome. Um, I wrote down that maybe before we ask more questions about, or before I ask more questions about kind of esoteric concepts that it would be helpful if Alyssa, you could tell me, and then just you could tell me like a little about the creative practice of like making your work. Like how do you, if it's a personal piece or if it's something maybe for a client, like how do you how do you make it like what do you do do you grab your watercolor brushes and just like go do you map it out on the computer and then print it out and then light box it and then do it over and then like i'm i'm belaboring the question but please tell me about your creative process <laughs> Alyssa, please i do a lot of work just for kind of myself like i don't have a lot of clients per se so Mostly, I mean, I have a day job that I work at four days a week, so I don't have sort of a luxury of like sitting at my table and waiting for inspiration or like, like I have a certain amount of time that I'm able to work. So I always have like a notebook or my notes in my phone. I sort of have like a little bank of inspiration, you know, whether it's a reference photo of a plant that I was really inspired by or um, yeah, so it kind of starts with that kind of inspiration and especially with like poetry and zines, they come in like a hard flash. They're like there and they're not going to shut up. They're very loud to me, these, these two things. And so I'll have to just like take notes and be like, ah, let, you know, edit later. Whereas working with painting, it's much more, it's a much calmer process for me where I sit down, I organize my space, you know, I light some candles, I make it nice, and then I just start working with color. Like that's really where, like the entry point for me. Um, sometimes I will start with the words, but usually with the painting, I just like want to sit down with a piece of, I paint on paper and just like go in with some colors and then the painting kind of builds itself. Um, I'm doing a lot less, like before I was doing a lot of poetry comics, so they were combined. Um, I'm doing a lot le less of that now and a lot more of like writing poetry and making paintings on paper. Um, they're, yeah, they're, there's something about keeping them apart now that I like. So that's just what I'm just going with it for now. <laughs> So yeah, that's, I mean, I don't use a computer really until I have to print, which I do most of my own, own printing on Risograph. And 
at that point, I'm a little bit like, oh man, I have to do these really, really intense color separations because I don't paint for a graphic. Like I don't think in that way. I did it once and it was so like uh, stop and start that it just, it didn't flow for me. And so now I just like do what I want and then I have to suffer for you know, hours per painting to get a, <laughs> to get yeah. a color separation. So that, that's really the time that I use the computer. And, you know, of course, when I share my work online, but it's pretty like tactile and crafty and like, there's definitely more texture and collage than you can tell online. So it's yeah, really... your, your originals are amazing. And you, you do some like hand marking of things sometimes too after they're printed. But yeah, nobody looks at your work and they're like, oh, that's this drum. Like that's this Riso drum. That's 401 or whatever. Like it's always <laughs> like, it's colors you don't see in other people's Risos. Like, yeah, that's dope. That makes sense yeah. to me. Yeah, it's painful, but I've decided it's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't do it that often. So it's really kind of like, all right, it's that's, Photoshop time. Yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> I've never seen anything that I didn't like that you made, so it's oh, working. Thank you, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> what about you? Can you talk about your process? Yeah, um, so I think almost always it starts with like scribbles in my sketchbook. So it's always pencil to paper first. Um, and I think like the rest of the process really differs based on who the work is for. Um, so for a lot of editorial work, um, I would make some scribbles and try and replicate like a more, uh, roughs that people understand essentially, uh, on Photoshop, uh, and try and communicate that in the same way that I did on paper for myself. Um, but yeah, that, uh, it's mostly like problem solving when it comes to editorial illustration anyway. And I think, uh, having training in, uh, first animation, which was in like a design school really kind of prepped me to think, uh, that particular way. Uh, so I like, I like the constraints. I like the deadlines and that like, I find invigorating in some twisted masochistic way. <laughs> um, so that's how I think I approach my editorial. It's almost all like digital from then on. Um, with a lot of personal like zine work and sketchbook work and gallery work, I think it's free form. It's like I'm my own boss. So they grow pretty organically. Um, sometimes it stays like from beginning to the end in the sketchbook. Sometimes it gets onto like fancier paper um but mostly it's like just brush pen and pencil um and a lot of my finished work i don't um uh, erase the pencil lines because i like that it feels like it's carried on to the final um with comics uh, so i i did my undergrad in animation so i'm going to use an animation like animation terminology if I don't animate anymore, I think it's like too tedious and not for me. Um, but I think of it as like keyframing, uh, where you're just thinking of certain moments that could be uh, important for the narrative. Uh, and then I just go on filling the rest of the story till it starts to like make sense. Uh, a lot of my comics are autobiographical, even though I haven't done that much comics in a while. Um, so they, I find the whole thing like quite daunting and it takes me back to like an animation frame of mind, which is like trauma, undergrad trauma for me, uh, <laughs> which is why I like try and stick to illustration or like smaller zine making, um, that isn't as like narrative focused. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like a good mix of, I think, analog and digital, even a lot of my sketchbook work that I've been doing recently, I've been trying to introduce more and more color, which is new for me. Um, but yeah, it's, I just let it go wherever it needs to 
beef. Like if it's saying it needs to be in color, I don't fight it. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I mean, both of your answers about, you know, building something visual imply this kind of like, intuitive, you know, the problems to solve are like using some level of intuition that's maybe not um, rational or logical or like, you know, and but comics like comics want some sort of narrative or some sort of anchor, you know, if a comic's wordless, it's still, there's still some narrative flow to it. And if there are words, then, you know, clearly something's being added and i th that's an interesting problem that like okay i definitely want to tell this story about the time my cat did this but i also want to access the part of myself that is like lost in the woods and like looking for the mystery like <laughs> trying to like find the thing that i you know and uh and that's why i like comics better than anything else i think because like that's a really hard problem. That's like, <laughs> that's a really hard problem to try to address and solve. And when it's working, it just feels better than anything. Cause it's like, wow, you know, like this, this was the right way to say that one thing. And this was the right image. And you I might, you know, if I make something that's 80 pages long, it might only happen three pages or something, but it's like worth it just to like get, you know? Fascinating. Thank you both for those answers. Um, I have a question. I don't know if this is the right, well, maybe this question would be better now. Like drawing for me, like I was saying, is kind of like a hidden path. Like I, if I'm drawing, like I was drawing, a, a friend had died and had left this diagram that was meaningful to them about um, some of the relationships in their life, right? And it was just a, like a sketchbook drawing. And another friend wanted to get a tattoo of this because it was meaningful to them, but it was like compressed, right? It was, so, you know, I scanned it and I'm in, I'm at what's Clip Studio? Yeah, it's called Clip Studio now, right? Like I'm in Clip Studio and I'm just like, and I'm like, okay, this is a line, but like a wavy line is on top of it to connect these two people. And these hexagrams fit here and this triangle fits here. And it was just like a simple geometric thing, but it again, felt like the mystery. It just felt like so close to that person who had drawn it that it was like very emotional, you know? And to look at the thing at the end, I was like, Anytime I start anything, I'm like, this is impossible. And anytime I finish it, I'm like, I don't think I did that. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if that resonates with you, but it feels to me like a hidden path that is almost accessing like some magical thinking part of my brain that maybe isn't entirely me. <laughs> so the question is like, can drawing feel to you like a parallel to a kind of spiritual journey for yourself and however you would choose to define that. And I, you know, feel free also to talk about, we talked about your childhoods, but please feel free to talk about like where you are now in a spiritual journey as well. <laughs> Joss Chip, please, you have a big smile on your face, please. <laughs> yeah, because all of these questions are really intense. Um... And I'm just trying to think of how I resonate with this. Um, I think I think when you spoke about um, like you don't know what you're gonna create, and when it's done, you're like, "Who did that?" Uh, that kind of happened to me with like the series of drawings that I actually started during like COVID uh, or I, I started experimenting with visuals like that kind of pre-COVID a little bit, but um, there was a lot of like distortion and melting and like figures uh, stretching in like kind of grotesque ways. Um, and I would just think of 
like a mood or a point of view and just start drawing and then it would just become this like huge really gory thing and by the end of it i'm like i don't know how that put itself out but it's out there um and again a lot of those drawings have so i with my finished work like if i leave pencil lines i i like to think of them as ghosts of the drawing um and yeah and and i and i like that they're included in the final like i'm i'm not stripping the final piece away from its like journey of getting there it's also a nice way for me to understand how i got there sometimes when i'm like i don't know who did that um so i think those pencil lines like are they really like guide me from like start to finish um yeah and that's kind of how i would uh did that make sense at all it made sense to me and i i'm certainly interested in the ghost like whatever the haunt whatever is haunting an image i'm certainly very very that resonates with me so much because you see every iteration of like what something is that and no one else sees those things. Yeah. And I think there's an honesty to leaving your pencil lines there too, because it's very, I mean, everyone just light boxes everything now. It feels like a lot of my contemporaries and probably other uh, episodes in this series of cake audio programs will be about just how to light box perfectly and like w which pens to use and things. But I like something that feels built, you know? I like something that feels like I can see a process. And I think, you know, for me that resonates in terms of, yeah, everything I think about meditation and everything I think about my own like spiritual journey, like Thing, one thing followed from the next and kind of led me to one place and then away from something else. And it's just, it, it's a nice metaphor for life <laughs> to me. Yeah, it made sense to me. I don't know. Did it make sense to you, Alyssa? I have to unmute. Yes, it did. <laughs> uh, I was also thinking about when you were talking about redrawing your friend's drawing. Um, I do that with tarot sometimes. Um, I work with tarot a lot, but I don't know a lot formally about tarot. I mean, enough now over the years. But one of the ways that I kind of like went into that, like an entry point was redrawing tarot cards and like noticing with my hand the symbols and the different things that were in there that maybe I kind of just like took in as a whole image. So I really, yeah, that resonates with me, that sort of like tracing of another person's work. And I actually do that a lot at my day job. It's something I think about a lot. I work for an artist who makes like big gestural work. And then I kind of have to go through and do the more tedious like tracing of those and cutting out of, of those images with mother of pearl. So there's, yeah, that's definitely a thing I think about a lot, like using your hand as someone else's hand and like what that experience shows you of the other person's sort of like something. I don't even know if there's a word for it, but like knowing something about that artist by tracing their work. So there's that. And then I think you mentioned something about uh, like a it, whether it was a spiritual journey. That about. sounds like something I would say. <laughs> and I was just going to say that, like, I don't I don't know if I look at it like that, but I look back and I can kind of trace it through. Through the work that I've shown, like, yeah, where I was what I was learning, like a lot of the work that I do will integrate the teachings of, I have a couple teachers and I can go, I went back and looked at some of it and was like, oh, that's when I was learning. Like, I'm not my mind. And like, wow, look like all this stuff that 
ran through there for those few weeks was like kind of in that theme and yeah it's almost it's like a journal a little bit because my work is definitely very connected to my journey and I also leave a lot of I also layer in my work a lot there's a lot of like hidden work but um some of it is like when I don't know when to stop because I'm like a maximalist in this way, which like, I wish I was a minimalist, but I'm like, keep going, add more, add more. And then I'm like, oh. ah, I ruined it. Cover it up, cover it up. Okay, it's blank again. And then like, <laughs> so there, you know, there are a lot of paintings under paintings and so, some of those things will come through and stay. Um, but I'm getting, I spoke with a friend recently and talk to her about giving more space in that time where I, I stop and see like, this is a painting and it could live on its own right now, but I wanna keep working, like yeah. actually walking away from that because it's so hard to do. It's hard to like step away and be like, oh, I'm gonna give this space. So I, that's a practice right now that I'm trying <laughs> and it works sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, everything about that is surprising to me because your work looks fully formed in it. But I can, yeah, there are, there are often like fields of color that feel like they have depth to them that maybe I can't visually perceive, you know? Like there can feel the spirit of something under it, even if I can't like see it, right? That's awesome. I that was a really good I answer. Like now, I feel like now that you've said it, I would probably go back to like noticing some of those things in the work that I would have completely like not looked at before. In your own work or in Alyssa's work? Oh, in Alyssa's work. Not in yeah. Work. She sent me a tarot card postcard. I don't even remember which which arcana, like which one it was, but I've been obsessed with drawing the tarot ever since you did that. And like, it's, that's kind of all I drew last year. And I, I read about, you know, I read about how color is very specifically used in certain decks and especially like the, you know, original decks, the decks from the 1400s and just adapting those colors, but really like counting like, okay, there's six lines to the right of this word. And like, there's three lines on the devil's like thigh here and like this three and the six. And like, what does that mean to me? And how do I feel about that? And just like, just literally redrawing them, not tracing them, but just feeling my way through it. Yeah. So yeah, you really inspired me with that. And I thought that the, the one you shared with me was like really successful. <laughs> it was like really good. Thanks. I did Thank a three you. pack of those cards. Oh. Like I was, I did the, um, the sun, the magician and the fool. And I have so many of the fool left because I feel bad. Like, it's not a bad card. It's a great card. But if you're not a person who's, <laughs> who's in to tarot, you might be like, why did she send me the fool card? <laughs> so I started sending them more for like political campaigns since oh, I had yeah. so many extras. <laughs> <laughs> that is appropriate. Okay. What about pilgrimages then? Like as an artist, you know, there's this this spiritual practice of going to Mecca or Tibet or Jerusalem Jerusalem or Camino del Santiago is like a popular there are a lot of films about Camino del Santiago and tons of them that I don't know about. Is there, uh, are there ways that your life as an artist has included pilgrimages like to, or like goals as an artist to visit a certain piece of art or to exhibit at a certain show or a, just a place or a person is, uh, if, if any of that has meaning to you, uh, just Joe. Um, so I think within like my artistic career, of course, like everyone has like specific goals in terms of like, 
oh, these are people I want to work with, or these are people, places I want to like show work at, or this is where I would like to see my work printed. Um, but I think that goal keeps shifting uh, more and more. And as you like sort of pass these goals, they almost start to feel um, really, really small. Like you didn't have bigger goals <laughs> to begin with. Um, and um, I'm not sure like within like my artistic journey, like what the ultimate goal is. Um, and it seems to grow fa further and further uh, as I keep making work. Um, but I think um, over time I've learned to be okay with that. I earlier, I think was very goal, especially when I was in India, because a lot of the people that I envisioned like working with were not like in reach. Um, and now, uh, but some of them are that I feel like the goal shift. And I think when we're talking about pilgrimage, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is there always like a place to be? And once you're there, the pilgrimage is like, or that sort of journey is like complete. I mean, I think that there are ones with different stops mm -hmm. and <laughs> you can like do as many stops as you want. There's mm -hmm. one of temples around Japan, right? Um, I'm no expert. <laughs> <laughs> I liked what you said about not knowing what your ultimate goal is. And I think that is probably resonant with anyone alive right now. <laughs> That is a powerful statement to make. Like ooh, we all, we make a lot of drawings and we make a lot of work, and like you both get better and better and better, and like there's so much progress over years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like what? Yeah, that is that is a question without maybe an answer, but what a thing to say. <laughs> Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm no expert. I'm just a person. I thought you were going to say TCAF. Me? I thought maybe you'd say TCAF oh. or something. <laughs> yeah. For me, it was TCAF. And, you know, it was great. Yeah. I had a great time. <laughs> I've, I've still not been to TCAF, so that's probably the next goal. Okay. So your goals have gotten smaller, kind of. Is that what you were saying? Like you had like these goalposts for yourself, and then yeah, or or now I, I guess out of the past year and a half, I don't have any goals, or I haven't like taken time out to like. Oh, everything's like shaken itself, like in a way that um, I just feel like what's the the goal is to just create and evolve and learn and grow and change and all the work's just gonna land wherever it needs to <laughs> yeah there's a way that we got off the hamster wheel like pretty hard <laughs> right mm -hmm. like, <laughs> i'm very curious about that that's that's a good answer how did what do you think Alyssa? does that resonate with you i mean that's that's something to say yeah, when I was looking at this question earlier, I was like, I don't, I don't think I have a good answer because I don't think I have goals. <laughs> Is that bad? <laughs> so, yeah, and especially in the last, like you were saying, in the last year and a half, it's just the goal is to be uh, present and compassionate and kind to my neighbors and yeah there, there's not a lot past that at the moment yeah but and I mean for me like my day job got more difficult you know I, I have like a design job where I'm the in-house person in an office and to do that remotely and kind of grow what I was doing and kind of carve off more work for myself like 
to prove my value and to be accountable and to like show that I was doing a lot was like, that was kind of where my creative energy went, you know? And the fact that there weren't shows necessarily to make me accountable to like make something new um, just meant that when I created something, it was just, it was usually in service of like learning more about chakras, learning about Reiki, learning about energy, like trying to like work with something or document something for myself. So I have all these zines of like Kundalini awakening and like, like trying to like understand some concept and see if it resonates with me or just like trying to learn it. But I'm not sure I'm going to share those ever. You know, I have a lot of zines of song lyrics too, but like they're beautiful and I love them, but I don't know. I don't know if I need to share that with anybody. It's okay. Yeah, I don't know. But I mean, so, but I mean, in India, it's like the beginning or middle right now. In America, it's, it's we're somewhere. The numbers are going down. And there, for me, it's much more stressful to think about the world starting back up again than it was for me to make my world smaller. Like I liked making my world smaller. I was very burned out by everything that was going on. And as particularly socially, like I liked, I liked just like the microscope, like I get up, I do this at 11 o'clock. I do my work. I have tea at this time. Then I look at this for this long and then I do this. And I, I liked that Groundhog Day ness of just always being here and having a little bit of interaction with people online but like mostly not so like the anxiety that i think a lot of people felt about it shutting down is like for me is now yeah <laughs> like now is when i need help because there's a lot i've learned about myself having been isolated like this and and i've been very fortunate that people in the bubble that i'm in and my wife and people I care about that I've been able to see, but the things I've learned about myself are maybe it's going to be hard to live the way I was living in an authentic way, having made my world a lot smaller and being like, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted. I just wanted one banana and one kind bar <laughs> and one protein shake and to sit literally here <laughs> all day and look out the window and ride my bike at this time. And if I say three words all day, great. If I say a million words, great. The next thing that I have, the next question that I wrote was about, Alyssa, you wrote me about an altar that you made with like Alice Coltrane, people who were inspiring to you. It's a tiny altar with tiny paintings and it's a diorama of an altar. Oh, sorry. No I made problem. a I made a little box, um, actually for something I was selling at a festival. It was like a witch kit. Mm. Um, so I had some of them left over, and then I added a little platform so that you can lift up the platform and store your little extra paintings underneath near different little like altar accoutrements. Um, so yeah, again with the small space that I'm in it really, it felt really good to make a small altar, but I, I always work with altars. Like I always have a place where I put pretty things together that resonate with me and make me feel like whatever, whatever feeling I'm going for, if I need to feel like protected or if I, you know, whatever it is with different plants and images and yeah like you said all artists who I like or who inspire me um, yeah I recently added Nikki de San Fal to my altar she has a show up at um, PS1 right now that's just like it's just so joyful and beautiful and I think that that's like a feeling I want to um lift up right now a little bit a little bit of joy a little bit of heart opening 
not too fast after the last year and a half, but you know, that sort of like spring feeling of like flowers opening, hearts opening, people opening and being kind to each other <laughs> while it's happening. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, just seeing people's faces again and being able to like smile at someone is crazy. It's crazy. Just being, you know, people complimenting each other in businesses around the street. I mean, it's been like, it's been strange to not do that, but yeah, this opening. And even the desk behind you um, feels like a curated workspace that maybe has an element of just like organizing and intuitive like placements right like i'm i'm sorry this is an audio medium and i'm referring to something visual but <laughs> yeah it makes sense yeah Our i think spaces, that, right? yeah i think like i'm like a super scorpio and then i found out a few years ago that i have libra rising and i was kind of shook but then i was like oh that makes so much sense for the spaces that i like to create like these like pretty things that go together and make me feel good so i think it happens in all the little nooks and crannies of my world it's not always all happening at the same time there's definitely like mess happening <laughs> but there's always little crevices with little surprises and artworks of friends and yeah just i like to yeah i like to make a comfortable space to to open yeah yeah so i feel like i've not consciously thought about putting things together with the intention of it feeling alter like but i think hearing Alyssa talk about just even making nooks in the apartment i feel like we we grew up with very little space in india so it's me um so it's me my sister my parents which was one family and my dad's two brothers and their respective families all living in one house we here call like a joint family um and we didn't have like even a room <laughs> to ourselves like all the kids were in the living room and all of the parents just had like their rooms and it was like a common kitchen a lot of the space was shared so we didn't grow up with a lot of like artwork in the house or freedom to like be able to put up a lot of stuff around so um I mean, now everyone lives in on their own like floor in the same house. So we have a little bit more space. But um, I remember when I moved to Baltimore, um, I just wanted to cover the entire place up with artwork that I loved. Um, because it just felt like such a nice way to build something from scratch and have it feel like a place where you just feel welcome or where you can rest, where you can create and feel like you belong. Um, so even when I think I was 14 and we were building like the first floor of the house where we were gonna move, uh, I knew my work desk in my room had to have like a pin board so that I could like pin like these little things that I'd cut out from newspapers or little like postcards that I'd collected or um, stupid things I liked. Um, and I think I carried that forward in the workspace that I have in Baltimore, even though it's a lot less organized. Um, it's essentially a desk next to my bed, which faces a blocked off uh, fireplace um, because it's an old like row house in Baltimore um, with all non-functioning fireplaces. Uh, but I like to, it has like some like sense of like symmetry to it, uh, which I really like. Uh, and I always keep like shifting up the display to whatever will like activate me when I sit and work there. And that feels really nice. Um, sometimes I even put like a bunch of my artwork up on the walls. Um, a lot of the work that I do is has like figures in it. Just to see if like they feel like they are having some sort of like a conversation with the space or with each other. Um, and that's something that I find really interesting and also kind of helps me um, create more work that can live in other people's spaces uh, successfully. Um, 
but but yeah i really enjoy being able to build like these small spaces within my apartment where and i've realized over the past 2 years i've actually spent like 90% of my time in just those corners um and that feels uh special to be able to do that that's brilliant i mean there that seems like almost like shamanic intuition to be like i want this drawing to talk to this drawing here right that's like that's godlike or it's like Mm, that's nice. That's really nice. And amazing you can you want to look at your own work. That's a that's what a miracle. I don't know anyone who wants to look at their own work. Like that's beautiful. I mean it's very good. Yours is very good, so I guess that helps. Wow, both really good answers. Thank you. I hope people are enjoying this. Um I have one of my own paintings hanging up, so Solidarity oh, behind you there. That's <laughs> Not awesome. that one, but it's, oh, it's like, you probably can't see it. It's that little uh, volcano. Yes. But I, I will have a little it. piece of my work hanging up usually also. That's good. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> but that's cool. Um, yeah, shifting gears again. I was thinking about how you know, I practice Theravada Buddhism and mindfulness and meditation. And one thing in meditation that I talk, talk that I'm in one exploration that I'm involved in and that practice is the inner critic, right? And I just was very self-depreciating about my own work or not wanting to look at my own work. So obviously that's a struggle for me, for sure. Uh, and like, to me, that's a path. That's like a kind of a central thing to just not judge myself. And Alyssa, you talked about working with a teacher to get to a place of like, I'm not my mind. I'm not my thoughts. Um, this is something I think about in a spiritual context a lot and something I read about a lot, but then also as an artist, like the self-critic is like so such a big part of what is happening, right? There are so many decisions to make in the production of something. And it's like, does this look right? Is this going to look right three steps from now when I try to draw this? Do I have enough room to draw this part? Is this bad? You know, like, like it, it just activates all of that stuff. And it's not even like necessarily, I don't know. It's, it's, it's so close to the process of just like what it means to make something <laughs> that for me, it's hard to kind of find a line. So I'm not sure it's super relevant given some of the rest of the things we talked about, but I'm wondering if for either of you, like how, the the inner critic how how self-judgment uh informs the work that you make and if that maybe ties into you know how you feel your spiritual practice if it is informed at all by spiritual practice Alyssa. so i think it's pretty relevant to most people and i say that because i took I was gifted from one of my best friends, uh, a 10 week self-compassion course that was um, in the fall through the winter and it like couldn't have come at a better time. And there were, I mean, just based on a survey of like the 35 people in my class, like everybody has a raging inner critic. And not, I mean, I'm not saying everybody does, but everybody in that, setting did so it makes it leads me to believe that a lot of people <laughs> deal with that sort of inner critic and I definitely have dealt with that a lot and I didn't even realize that I could separate from it until like more recently in my life and that's really like freeing in a way and I got really sad because I was like what why didn't I know that I could separate from that voice when I was younger? 
like why that would have saved me so much pain, <laughs> but you know, um, glad to know now that there's a way to take space and to like really explore and look at that critic and wonder why, why it's so loud. Why is he being so loud? Like, no, whatever. I, I called him a him. Okay. He's a, <laughs> my inner critic's a guy, I guess. <laughs> but, like, why is he talking so loud? Like, what is the thing? And then kind of like quieting him down, quieting him down, quieting him down and realizing like, it's a protective thing. You know, it starts as this protection and then just kind of grows. So it, it's, yeah, the hope is to like make the artwork and not listen to the thoughts, you know, like I spent already, you know, whatever, 35 of, of my years of life listening to the thoughts and thinking that was me, you know, and then like finding this space, I'm like, all right, it's time to like really go in, you know, through the body, through like something that's not the intellect. Um, and yeah, he says stuff all the time and I'm like, cool. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's terrible. I don't know. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> or I'm not, you know, it's, it's just giving it less weight and feeling a little like, like putting him from the drive, the probably not the driver's seat. I hopefully I'm in the driver's seat, but putting him like more in the back seat and being like, okay, we'll, we'll still listen, but um, not, not feeling so much pain from that inner critic, I think is really the, the way forward for me. <laughs> um, so I, I grew up in India where I feel like criticism and judgment are kind of just they cultivated to a point where you like paralyze yourself. It's like if you're not going to do it yourself, other people, your neighbors, family, distant family, strangers will just do it for you. They will tell you exactly what's wrong uh and where you're not succeeding and what you should have done right or it's a it's a thing it's just a cultural thing so i think um uh i i grew up with a very warped self, self, uh, sense of self-worth um and i think as queer people especially like closeted then it's like an additional layer of like self-loathing and self-doubt so um so yeah, there was definitely a lot of that. I like to think of my like inner critic as, uh, or our relationship as kind of like frenemies <laughs> where it's like, I will acknowledge you uh, and I know you're there and we'll hug it out and you can hang around, but I'm not gonna give you too much power. Um, and I feel like in certain areas of my life, I've been able to get like a lot more uh, control over that, uh, especially my work, um, where I'm just able to create things with uh, less care. Um, but it still is like a voice that's very much present in other areas of my life, whether it's like my relationship with my body or the clothes I choose to wear or like my conduct, uh, social or with myself, my relationship to food even. Um, so I think in some ways, I think I would just like to be like, okay, like, shh, like let me just do my thing for now. Um, but I also think in some ways, um, it keeps me grounded, keeps me on my toes. Um, it helps keep my head in the game, which is something that I think um, we all need uh, at times. So yeah, that's kind of how I think of my relationship with my inner critic it's um, complicated <laughs> that's a good point though that like it's something you are actively working with and making frenemies with and aware of and like you have this um when i was listening to you talking at the end i was thinking okay well yeah i was frenemies and i was like what it's saying is not true. It's not me and fighting and fighting and fighting. Um, 
and my dad passed away in 2014. And there was just a lot of like, you know, the, the kind of grief of that and the recovery from that, where I was like, well, he was wrong about a lot of things and he was from a different generation. But now later with some perspective, I'm like, this does help guide me. Like some parts of his, you know, criticism or judgment or just like the ways that he exercised love, you know? I mean, he was a Catholic man born in the thirties and like some of the ways he exercised love and just the, the ways he had to, the, that was just the tools he had, you know? And so when you're like, sometimes it's a, uh, Sometimes it's kind of there to help you. It's like, yeah, and I don't take it personally, you know? Stuff about my body or um, my orientation or my gender, obviously not that stuff, but, <laughs> but how I navigate the world or, you know, how I treat people or how I accept being treated, you know? That's kind of a thing recently is like, people ask very large things of me kind of regularly. <laughs> regularly, people will ask me to do something very difficult and I'll be like internally like fuming, like I'll be mad, but I won't just say like, oh, that was a big ask. That was a huge thing to ask me, you know? And I don't mind. I just want you to acknowledge that that was like, a huge, huge thing. Like that was gonna take me hours and it's not what you asked for originally and in all areas of my life, right? So there's a way that like his guidance and that is like, stand up for yourself a little bit. <laughs> yes, be nice to everyone. Yes, accept everything that comes to you. Yes, just like be a guest house for the feelings and thoughts and the, the people around you and just be as supportive as you can. But also like, yeah, maybe stand up for yourself once in a while, you know, maybe you'll feel better. Oh, I just had to get that off my chest. Um, I'm so glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's honest. I, I'm not making this up. <laughs> Oh. Alyssa, I feel like we talked about how plants kind of inform your work. And I, I feel like you've kind of talked about that in other ways. If there's more you want to say about that, we, we can. Or if there's more you want to say about Reiki, like now would be, now would be an opportunity to do that. That's, um, yeah. if there's anything you'd like to say. I think with the plant stuff, um, when we were talking earlier about like what we did and didn't do during the last year and a half dur during COVID and stuff, um, I was um, invited to be in a group with someone who I studied yoga with, who's a Finnish woman. And um, she went through herbalism school and her final sort of offering was to gather a group of like nine people across the world and do plant studies with them um and it was like mostly sing like each person got one plant um and in our conversation I ended up with three like one that I chose one that she chose and one that an oracle deck chose um and it made this really nice like stable you know group of three plants that were really like supportive through COVID. And I spent a lot of time planting them and watching them grow and learning about them in a, a bunch of different ways and making medicines with them and tinctures and essences. And then the part that relates to my art practice was sort of asking those plants for information through drawing. So I would be like, with my violet plant, you know, like, what do you got for me? What do you have to say? And then I would just start and work. And some things, it was almost like with the tarot, like some things were revealed to me 
through that process. Um, so yeah, they've been a major like teacher for me throughout my life, like working on organic farms or whatever, you know, working at the farmer's market, loving plants, but now it's gotten to like a little more of a like study that includes like the energetic properties that's really interesting and um again like not with the intellect and a lot more with the feeling and the touching the drawing the opening to receiving so that's been a huge part of my last year and then being able to like share medicines um with friends and you know different people in my community being able to use these like protective medicines or like heart opening with boundaries and courage and all these things that like I feel like a lot of people needed in the last year that was really it was a really special project and you know I met with this woman on zoom like every month and she gave me information about my plants and different directions to look in and Oh, yeah, it was a really beautiful project that was a little less art, but had art involved in the way of like learning and listening. That makes sense. Thank you for talking about that. Um, I don't know if this is too personal to talk about or I, we can edit it out, but you were talking about the violet plant, like just sitting with it and seeing kind of like how what when it's it's not talking to you when it's communicating with you what's happened like what is the process like where do, do you feel that in your body somewhere does something are you is it a color pop into your mind please if you're if you're comfortable talking about that please tell me yeah i think it's sort of just like similar to an open awareness meditation mm. like opening the awareness opening keeping opening and looking really really looking like we see so much and we're assaulted by so many like images all the time but like there's this like softening of a gaze to look at something and yeah i get feelings in my body and like one time, like specifically with the violet, I had it sitting on my pillow uh, in my bed and I was just staring at it for a while. And then I started to get like super sleepy. Like really, it was, I don't know, like six in the evening or something. And I was, then I kind of investigated that a little bit and found out that in certain cultures they used violet for insomnia. And yeah, and then with the artwork kind of like, like you talked about chakras and I'll, I'll draw and the plant will touch different parts of like a character in the drawing. And I'm instantly like, oh, what, what does that mean for the throat chakra? Like that all of the energy of the plant is pointing in that direction. So it's just, you know, it's just, it is very personal and it, you know, some people will be like, oh, that's total bullshit. <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, I just am like, I really believe in the energy of plants and I've experienced it so many times in so many ways. And um, they're just great teachers and they're accessible. You know, there are like plants everywhere, pretty much. And yeah, I mean, that's the thing about the spiritual practice is that it's like so ordinary. You know, like when I was younger, it was like, these are the bright lights that I see when I meditate or like, this is, you know, Dharma bums on the road and like, you know, these sort of spectacular things. But as I like go deeper and get older, it's sort of just like, this is normal. This is every day. This is not, you know, fantastic. It's just like, it's just pretty normal. And I think that that's really shown through plants, you know, because they're everywhere, they're normal. We see them every day, but like, if you like dip into one plant and like go in there, it's great, it's amazing. I don't think anyone could argue with the statement that there's like a deep looking, like if you actually focus on something deeply, that something is happening outside 
your normal experience or outside your way of navigating or processing the world. That seems to me like universally understood by, uh, by you know, that, yeah. And it, it's, I wish I had thought of that when I was preparing this because that might have even been a better structure to think about how we look when we draw. And that there's a real, like if we're drawing a subject or, or whatever it is, like there's something that's not, not rational, not logical, but we're taking something in and we're, we're synthesizing it into something else. And it's here, but yeah, my, my body just started tingling the whole time you were talking about that. I, that really resonated with me. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Joshua is now would now be a time to talk about the paragraph that you sent me as we were kind of preparing this and talking about what it might be. Because I feel like we haven't teased out a lot of those those questions and those issues. I'm not sure I remember what I said. Uh, so I might okay. need to revisit that. I mean I can I can read it. Just you were talking about 9-11, you were talking about the household and religion and cultural practice and spirituality and just microaggressions and violence and that you feel like the strongest spiritual connection you have is to your work. So um, you were writing about this kind of like this background of, of aggression because of how you present to the world. And then you make this very bold statement that's like, my spiritual practice is the work that I make. <laughs> please tell me more about um, that, please, 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 please. <laughs> so I guess um, we grew in like a religious household. So that was a huge part of our praying, going to the temple. Um, as kids, we would like go to the temple and learn how to play the harmonium and uh, sing hymns. And every month we would like do the, uh, all of the sort of programming and handle like all of the things that need to be handled at the temple. Um, so I think a lot of that was already a huge part of my upbringing uh, in a way that we almost took it for granted. Um, and I think even just spirituality or like daily rituals that uh, come from like a spiritual point of view um, are just there and you don't question them. Um, and I feel like I only started to uh, understand and value them when um, I was kind of uprooted from my context uh, and when I moved to Baltimore um, and from a completely, it was also my first time out of the country so I had many reasons to be like <laughs> nervous and anxious um, and one of them was also my experience having a turban on my head and walking around the streets of Baltimore um, and it was interesting to me how much energy people would invest in just saying horrible stuff to me, on, whether it was on the streets, whether it was in enclosed spaces, whether it was online spaces. Um, and that just felt like something that I wanted to investigate in my work. Um, and that wasn't like a Sikh temple that was like accessible where I live in Baltimore, which I'm okay with. Um, and I just started to create work around my identity that felt more like uh, a way to sort of 
connect, reconnect back to my context. Um, I was also making a lot of like, doing a lot of just one commission project after another when I was in India before I moved to Baltimore um, and experiencing kind of like burnout uh, and nothing felt personal or that it was advancing me as an artist at all. Uh, and I think when I was so far away from everything I knew, it kind of made all of those like everyday mundane things a lot more precious. Um, so I just, even through like my MFA, a lot of the work became like looking inward than looking outward, uh, which was a huge change for my practice. Um, and I feel like I've continued that in even uh, other parts of my work, whether it's like commission or editorial or comics, uh, where I just think of it as like a release now more than ever, or if I'm feeling any like angst or anger towards like someone who said something horrible, like I almost feel like it's pointless to invest like any kind of energy in stuff like that. And I think creating work around it feels like the right like channel to like pour that into. Um, more than I thought could could be helpful. Like I, I'm a Leo, so I'm hot headed, <laughs> and I think my first response is always to just be like, say something like really uh, harsh. But um, over time, I feel like I've, uh, as with like my inner critic, I feel like I've just dealt with like outward criticism of me, my identity, my work. Uh, also through just like the work that I create, whether it's very direct in addressing that or if it's just some weird reference that no one will understand. It's just my way of um, finding some resolution to what would otherwise drive me insane. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and I think over time I've become a huge believer on like things happen for a reason or like the natural order of things um which i would like try and fight a lot when i was younger and angstier uh and now i've just like learned to roll with it and high five it and move on <laughs> So there's a way that your work balances kind of things that you don't like about the world, maybe like internally and also externally that it's yeah. just kind of counter. Is that, am I reading that? Is that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's something happening inside you and also just like by putting it out into the world, like yeah, helping just, balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It like, it just calms me down and even just the, process of working on something or just putting ink to paper and spending like an hour with like a sheet and just hearing the pencil like move over paper feels like meditation in a way um, and I really I've, I've come to enjoy that a lot more or notice that even a lot more than I used to that's really cool I've done a couple of workshops that were a formal meditation practice and then like a little bit talking about meditation and art and then making art together, you know, like maybe a jam comic or maybe just drawing a little bit and pass to the next person. Um, and yeah, people really resonate with treating drawing as meditative or a meditative type of drawing. And it has been cool to just be like, well, let's actually meditate. Like, like, let's not make it a half measure. Let's like actually go in and even just take five minutes or 20 minutes and then see what comes out. Um, yeah, I was disappointed because I was doing a bunch of those right when COVID um, made it not really possible to do those in person. And I feel like there was a great 
exchange happening when they were happening in person. I haven't done any of them over Zoom, I don't think. I don't remember. Thank you for that coherent and comprehensive answer about things that seem very essential to you as a person. And I think no one will be surprised to find out you're a Leo. That's, that's right on. That's exactly right. And what a Leo you are. Like, thank you. Scorpio, perfect. Like, perfect. And yeah, so I mean, one, one direction we could go now, which Alyssa, you talked about, you know, the visual kind of coming into you and then synthesizing something out, but, you know, touch, like healing touch. We've talked about Reiki a little bit, you and I personally, um, I mean, I, 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 COVID, we weren't really allowed to hug our friends and stuff like that. And it's, you know, certainly made me more aware of just like the power of touch and how essential it is to, you know, the human condition and um, that it's a need, right? Maybe. But then also drawing is just like something you do with your hands and something that, you know, and some sort of energy is coming out of your hands or, you know, something's being made. Um, yeah, so definitely. I wonder, yeah, please explore this. Yeah, I think that when I thought about this a little bit, um, I think that my hands are maybe the only part of my body that I've continuously loved my whole life. Um, and that's like, that's sad and that's beautiful in a certain way. Like there's just so much, like having a human body is just difficult and being around other human bodies is difficult <laughs> and you know I mean everybody kind of knows I think um, those challenges but I always like when I was a kid made stuff with my hands or like and was like amazed by whatever it was like it could have been like a friendship bracelet or something but like the sort of weaving of threads and yeah it's that sort of just just loving my hands and using them in a way like honoring them in a way through artwork through reiki through just different practices in my day job i do a lot of gold leafing in like a traditional like water gilding method and that's just like I mean, it's amazing to, <laughs> it's like the most difficult material to work with. And I have big hands and I've, I've like learned how to be very delicate. And there's just something about it that I, I love. And we get, we get so much sensory information through our hands. There are so many nerve endings on our hands. Touch is so important, like, yeah, so. I really like my hands. <laughs> I'm learning to like the rest of me too. <laughs> um, yeah. Joshua, do you think, do you think about touch as part of the work you're doing or if you're in Photoshop, like, is there some physical, are there physical actions you do that you're like, oh, that was, that just like felt right. That was like tapping into, I'm like on the right track. Cause like the way I did that curve or is there something there for you that resonates? Um, uh, I just really enjoyed listening to Alyssa talk about her relationship with her hands and how um, that they, my hands like constantly surprise me. Um, I always thought I was just this huge like klutz and I couldn't do <laughs> things uh, right. And even just 
things like packing something, putting tape on something uh, over time has just become something like, oh, I, I just thought I would like completely mess this up and feel like I would be covered in tape like myself. Uh, but I'm not, um, but um, I don't think I have any such relationship with my Photoshop, unfortunately, but uh, a, lo a lot of my personal work, I think, um, I think in some of the, uh, so I go to this drawing group in Baltimore. Uh, it's like a little queer drawing group where we just, a model comes and we draw. Uh, over there, I feel like um, I found, I had to sort of like relook at the work that I was making um, and try something different. And uh, I really wanted to economize on the line uh, because I think a lot of my work is quite maximalist. Uh, and I think just creating a body over large pieces of paper with just like ink uh, felt quite meditative. Um, and yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm talking in circles, but um, yeah, I love my hands too. <laughs> I did notice that the figure drawing that you've been doing more recently, like there can be very few lines, but it is unmistakably you. I mean, like there, there's a maximalist thing in fashion in general, right? Like you just kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, some of the figures, the, your your Monday drawings, for example, it yes. might just be like very simple, but like no one would think that anyone else drew that. It, it's Thank just you. essentially you and it's wonderful. For anyone that's listening, those are man's Monday drawings. Man smut Monday drawings. <laughs> yes, because Mondays are hard. Mm -hmm. For some we people. must do anything we can to bring joy to our Mondays. It's a divine calling. It's a divine. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing something to help the world. I would no, like I to didn't. Think so. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's people like what you're doing, right? I mean, yeah, definitely. Def I know I like it. I didn't think your answer was circuitous. It made sense to me and it felt very honest. <laughs> and you didn't let me project my own bullshit about Photoshop onto you, which is <laughs> good for you. <laughs> Because I'm like, when I am laying something out or when I, that was definitely more about me than anybody else. So thank you. I appreciate, both of you, I appreciate your honesty so much. And I, this has been so fun. I've liked doing this so much. Um, that's kind of what I had to talk about. I mean, is, uh, we touched on a lot of things that don't have answers or conclusions um which is good <laughs> which is fine is there anything that you'd like to say in conclusion or anything we haven't touched on that that comes to mind for either of you no 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 well i'll just i mean i'll listen I was just going to, I was speaking on mute again. Uh, I was just going to say, not that I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I saw you shaking your head, but for some reason I couldn't just let you shake your head. I had to be like, oh. but okay. Um, I mean, I, I'm so grateful to both of you for just being honest with me about how you feel about this subject and, and it's not something I've really heard any one in our field talk about and that you just both have totally different approaches that have these human elements and commonalities and I just hope it was helpful for people to kind of think about the work that they do and think about you know the brilliant ways that both of you process the world 
to make work. It's it's wonderful. It's been absolutely wonderful to talk with both of you. And, you know, I couldn't be happier with, with how the conversation went. So thank you. Thank you both so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for making this happen. My pleasure. And um, yeah, just thank, thank you both. You. Thanks. And I was waiting for the motorcycles to go by. Sorry. But. Right. So it's a <laughs> wedding. A motorcycle wedding, I think. Um, we should have definitely got that in the soundscape. I think, uh, yes. I think it might have. There have been a few that have gone by. I did try to mute, though, when they went by. But that's happening <laughs> right now. And that's part of the spiritual practice is being like, okay, there are 150 motorcycles outside of my apartment before <laughs> I do a chat. <laughs> We're just going to yeah. breathe and, <laughs> and so proceed. Funny. It's <laughs> funny to, if it is a wedding, it's very funny to do that in a populated area when so many areas are not populated. Like I imagine just logistically that there would be opportunities for 150 motorcycles at um, a residence in parking lot in anywhere that's not Creek Point, like literally <laughs> anywhere. So like, you know, okay. It's, I mean, to each their own, I guess. I never understood. I, I wish them the best on yes. their journey together. Yes, <laughs> except everything is like, yeah. And I mean, what you were talking about, about, you know, not being your thoughts and, and just like, when I was a kid, my conception of spirituality was that like a, some being would visit me and give me direction or that I would get like messages from the beyond when actually it's just like my experience as an adult has been to be in the moment that I'm in or actually look in a meaningful way at something that's just right in front of my face and the only like there was no alien that came down that gave me advice or like there was no voice in my head it was just I was meditating with a group and for a minute I could conceive of having a self that was not the thoughts and not the monologue in my head and that that epiphany like five six seven years later like that that was the biggest moment of of any spiritual journey that i've had but it, it was just like that wasn't external <laughs> it was something mm -hmm. that just happened because i was where i was and like something switched and instead of me being the train going by i was what was behind it in the horizon and it, it changed everything yeah i'm still holding out hope a little bit of hope for the aliens but that's another panel yeah i mean i, I tried to <laughs> get us one for this i mean we had room <laughs> i tried to get one yeah it's not easy yeah but i mean yeah i don't know it's fun to read the stuff that and the government's investigations of aliens and stuff. It's fun to read. And then I guess I am too. Or maybe we'll find out the plants are aliens. Maybe you'll flip a switch and you'll have access to the cosmos in ways that you don't understand. I don't know. It's creative. It's certainly creative. Um, I want to apologize for being an inexperienced moderator to anyone listening. And, uh, you know, I did my best and I tried to be prepared and tried to be present with uh, my guests. And I appreciate it so much that they were present with me and gave me such thoughtful answers. Thank you so much for watching Cake Pops. Cake is a volunteer run nonprofit organization. Your tax deductible support is vital to our financial stability and growth. If you'd like to learn more about Cake or consider donating, you can do so at cakechicago.com.